So <clears throat> our linear, our polynomial operator acts in a linear way. So we already talked about the P of D, the polynomial derivative operator. It's also a linear operator. So we'll look at the word linear to see what I mean here. So what linear means, <coughs> so the operator operates on, we'll go with alpha F1 plus beta F2. And we already saw this uh, earlier, but <coughs> the way that these work, you can distribute like this. And now using a constant multiple rule, alpha and beta are constants here. So alpha and beta are real numbers, F1 and F2 are functions. So it acts in this way. You can bring the constant, it's just the constant multiple rule, through the derivative operator. So when it acts in a linear way, this is what it means. You can split up over addition and scalar multiples factor through. So that's what it means to be a linear operator. So now we're going to have a theorem. We just, you don't really do need to do many more ex uh, practice examples watching me. You just need to practice a little bit on your own. They work in the same way that we computed them before. You're basically just distributing on them and then taking derivatives. So it's all the same algebra calculus rules you did before. So here's our big theorem. Uh, First part. I don't have this written in my notes, but I think the following are equivalent. Oh no, they're if thens. Okay. All right. So there's two parts. The first one is if y one through yn are solutions to this differential equation. Now remember PD, that's the polynomial derivative operator, and it could have uh, lots of different degree derivatives. <coughs> it does have to have uh, constant coefficients in front of the derivatives. So for example, I don't know if we did any, if we have any ODEs written here. No, we sure don't. All right, so I'll just write one really quick example ODE uh, on the right here in blue. So I'll just take one that we did last section. It does need to be linear. So we solved this linear ODE last uh, <coughs> two sections ago. I can write this as d squared minus 3d plus 2 y. How does this work? You distribute y across here. So you have d squared y minus 3dy plus 2y. And d squared y, that's the second derivative of y. dy is the first derivative of y, also known as y prime, plus 2y. And <coughs> we can write it as pd of y, where pd is that d squared minus 3d plus 2. So it basically lets us rewrite linear differential equations in terms of a polynomial operator. So it just gives us a different way to write out your linear equation. 
So any questions on that, what's in blue, turning a linear ODE, rewriting it as a polynomial operator? What we are going to be doing eventually is factoring this linear operator, this operator into linear factors and then <coughs> basically solving it one degree at a time. So that's, that's where we are going with this. It'll take a little while to get there. So if we have solutions to this uh, ODE right here, then the linear combination of all these, so y equals a1, y1 plus a2, y2 plus a n, y n is this is the what do we call this? The homogeneous solution. So that's the first part. Second part. <coughs> if YC is solution to the homogeneous version, which is P D Y equals zero, and Y P is solution to dy equals q of x, the non-homogeneous, then y equals yc plus yp is the general solution. We did prove these before. Uh, the reason that, that this all works is you would need to have a linear ODE so that when you apply the derivative you get those nice linear properties <coughs> that lets you rearrange everything. So I'm going to skip the proof. We did a really similar proof in a previous section. So we'll skip the proof. When your q of x function is a summation of some other functions, so I'll write them as qk of x from k equals 1. I don't want to use n. We'll go to m because there may not be the same number of uh, functions here as there is degrees. If I use n, I usually use that letter for the degree of the ODE. So I don't want to use n right here. Uh, you could find each particular, each particular solution to P D Y equals Q K of X for each K from one to N. M. So we'll let yk be the solution to this ODE. So basically you take one of the terms in Q at a time and you basically get one particular solution for each term. Uh, and then you just add together, you make a combination of all those yk's. Then yp is going to equal y1 plus y2 plus ym. Or you can just write a summation yk k equals 1 to m. Now we don't put constants here because this is not the homogeneous solution. So there are not constants in front of these. This is the particular solution. So then yp 
is the solution to PDY equals Q of X, where of course Q is the summation of those QKs. Uh, this is this method is called the principle of superposition. So I'm going to talk about some uh, notation for functions and it will save us a little bit of time writing down where things come from so I'm going to scroll back for a minute <coughs> so up here I just wrote f1 and f2 are functions they are functions but they need to be functions that are differentiable so the way that we're going to write that is this weird letter I think it's some type of weird cursive C. So just write that down, I'll explain it in a minute. So this will describe the type of functions we need. And I'll rewrite it down here. So our new notation, CN of I, if I write it out in set notation, this is going to be all functions with domain I. that can be differentiated n times. N or more times. But at least n times. <clears throat> so an easy function, uh, an easy continuous function that can't be differentiated is absolute value. So that's a super easy function to look at that you can't take a derivative. Uh, you, well, you can take a derivative, but not everywhere on its domain. What is that notation called again? Uh, it's, it's called, uh, we just call it C. It's, I don't think it's really a C, but it's called CN or C. We're about to write down C infinity. and derivatives are continuous. All right, so what type of functions can be differentiated? Lots of times, polynomials. You can take as many derivatives as you want of polynomials. Uh, rational functions, you have to be a little careful because they have, you in here, uh, if you're gonna put a rational function in, that means the domain is automatically limited basically take out all the x values that are asymptotes, which very much limits what other functions are going to be in there too. Um, so you can have rational functions, but you have domain issues. Uh, the trig functions are infinitely differentiable, but some of those have uh, vertical asymptotes as well. Uh, <coughs> C0. What this means, if you just read that definition, it's functions with a common domain that could be differentiated zero times and its zero derivative is continuous. So C0 of i, it's all continuous functions with domain i. So that's C0. The other extreme is C infinity. And these are uh, all functions with domain i that have infinite continuous derivatives. Sorry. 
Yep, sine, cosine, all the polynomials. Um, if we're taking i to be negative infinity to positive infinity, it'll be all functions you've probably seen without vertical asymptotes. Um, you got to get a little bit careful. Things like square root won't work here because, well, first of all, square root doesn't have a full domain, but also it has a vertical asymptote at the origin. Or I shouldn't say a vertical asymptote, a vertical slope at the origin, or an undefined derivative. Um, so there are some weird functions like that that may have a vertical slope somewhere. Um, so C infinity, all functions with uh, domain i that have infinite continuous derivatives. All right, so let's have some fun with notation. D is an operator. It normally eats functions. I'm going to feed it an entire set of functions at one time. So I'm going to take the derivative of every function that could be differentiated n times. Once you differentiate a function once, that was able to be differentiated n times, you could differentiate it more times after that, but the maximum is n minus 1 times. So that means the derivative of any cn function is cn minus 1. Well, it may not be equal, it may be a subset of so to be fully mathematically correct, I should write subset right here. Well, that's a little fun with higher order math notation right there. So that is the end of this section. Now we're going to... Subset? Subset, yeah. So in the book, this is all the same section. I'm worried that if I keep writing in here, it'll get really slow because I have five pages of handwritten notes. So what I'm going to do is just go to a new section. And it'll still be 24, though. <laughs> Do you need lines? I still wasn't expecting me to write a number. So we're going to look at. What do we do first? We're going to look at adding operators together. So we're going to operate on operators. Algebraic properties of operators now. <coughs> so, what I'm going to need is two operators. So, I like to call them P of D. So, I'm going to go P1 of D and P2 of D for my two different operators. You've, ad you've added polynomials together before. You just combine like terms, basically. Just look at the power of d and then add the coefficients together. So that's all we're doing right here when we add two together. Uh, if we apply it to some function f, you can, uh, we did this before, but you can distribute f like this. So you get p1 d of f plus p2 d of f. So we can distribute like this. Uh, coefficients work the same way. We are going to have a coefficient that's a function of x. So not just constant coefficients, but we'll have function coefficients. This look like alpha of x times p 
PD, so that entire operator of F, the way this will work, you'll just operate on F, and then when you're done taking the derivative or those derivatives, then you multiply the result by AX, or alpha X. So coefficient acts just like a multiple. So you just take the derivative like normal and then multiply by alpha at the ends. So we'll do an example here for practice on these rules. 2x squared, that will be our alpha right there. And then we'll do 3d squared plus d. And all this will operate on e to the 3x. So using those rules above, what I underline is alpha x. So this is going to equal, we'll leave alpha outside, and then we're going to apply 3d squared plus d to e to the 3x. And the way that we do this, we distribute. So that's 3d squared e3x plus d e3x. So the second derivative gives us 3 squared times 3, we get 3 cubed e to the 3x plus 3 e to the 3x. Now the calculus step is the easy one on this problem. It's everything else that's <coughs> tricky. I'm only doing this for technical reasons because my computer is going to run slow if I have too much writing in one section, basically. So you should be fine on your paper. I could factor 3 out or e to the 3x, but this is that's not really necessary for this problem. So this is exactly how it works. And now we're going to look at products of polynomial operators. So we looked at constant multiples or function multiples and sums. We're going to look at products now. So we'll go with P1D and P2D. So this is now going to act like a product. And we have also done examples of this before. You get to reassociate. And it looks kind of unimpressive when you just write it out. But the order is really important. So on the left, it says take this full operator here, the product operator, and then apply it to F. On the right side, it says take this operator, apply its F, and then when you're done, take the result and apply P1 operator to that. So it's really just an ordering issue right here. So that's how we do multiplication. So we'll do one example here. So right now, find the results of the operators in the order of operations I wrote down. So I want you to evaluate inside first, and then take the d squared minus d of that derivative you get. Yeah, you should have, and it, w it looks like it should be a polynomial of x. It'll, I think it will have an x cubed term and, and smaller terms.
Actually, I don't think I think we'll have x squared term at the most because the second derivative, the outer derivative, will reduce the power. The inner derivative, that plus one, keeps an x cubed term, so we won't lose it until the second step. Simplify your answer too. Combine late terms, simplify your answer. So you should have, it should be a degree two polynomial. And your coefficient should combine. And you should not be copying what I'm doing. I'm not doing what I told you to do. Now I'm doing the solving the problem the way that you solved it, hopefully. And let me know if I'm ma making a mistake right now on this side. I'm trying to do two derivatives simultaneously. Six and then zero zero <coughs> minus three x squared plus six x minus one. So we got negative three x squared six x negative six x plus seven. All right. So you should have had that work on the left side. You may have taken a couple more steps. I tried to minimize the number of steps I took. So any question on the left side? Now, what I did on the right side, I did algebra before calculus. So let's look on the right side. All I used was this rule up here that says you can multiply polynomials, uh, polynomial operators, or you could apply one at a time. So you guys applied one at a time. What I did was I multiplied everything together to get one overall polynomial operator. So. When I multiplied, my polynomial operator turned into d cubed minus d. It was basically some conjugates. And d cubed, that derivative was kind of tricky, but it turned x cubed into 6 and got the exact same thing. So it's up to you. You can still do algebra before or after you do calculus. So I recommend don't do them at the same time unless you're really confident with your calculus skills or your algebra skills. But I recommend, I generally don't do algebra and calculus at the same time, unless it's super easy. <coughs> yeah, but I still don't think I did, yeah, there's no step in here that I did both algebra and calculus at the same time. 
just kind of like like patting her head and rubbing her stomach, it's really just hard to do. Like it's easy to do one of those two, but it's hard to do both of them at the same time. So <clears throat> we're gonna look at factoring now. Um, here's one more algebra property. This one will be incredibly obvious once I write it down. All right, what algebra rule do we call this right here? Distributive rule. It's basically how addition and multiplication work together. So this is a nice trip down memory lane, back to pre-calculus one. So if P of D and DN plus A1D plus A0. <coughs> and if P of D factors. into, so if we take it all the way down to linear factors, so you may get some constant out front, but linear factors look like, in this case, oh, I'll write out what it looks like in x's. I'm using r's right here for root 1, root 2, root 3, root 4. These are all the zeros of the polynomial, so we're writing it uh, d minus the zero right there. And this is nth degree, so we'll have d minus rn. So there's fundamental theorem of algebra, which you did not forget. It says every polynomial can be factored. And the corollary is you can factor an nth degree polynomial n times into n linear factors. The only drawback is sometimes your factors might be complex. So if you get complex factors, that's fine. R1, R2, Rn may be real, may be complex. All depends on how it factors out. So you can always factor into linear factors, but sometimes they're complex. I think you had a quiz problem recently that had complex factors, or we did some example in class. Some problem recently we had complex factors. Uh, but P of D always factors completely. over the complex numbers. So I talked about how to multiply operators, but the question is, is multiplication of operators commutative? So is P1D, P2D equal to P2D, P1D? All right, this question really can only be answered if we look at how they're gonna operate on a function. Or we can use some of the algebraic properties that we had earlier. So what I just wrote down Actually, if the logical words are not correct here, if that then PD factors into, yeah, so every polynomial operator will factor into linear functions or linear factors. Well, what we can do here 
You could write out some big, huge P1 operator and a P2 operator, but you can always factor those into linear factors, and it comes down to, can we switch the order of linear factors? Because if I can change all the linear factor order, then I can just change the order overall. So we're going to just do the base case, which is, can I swap the order of linear factors? So we're going to check on uh, linear uh, polynomial operators. So let's take P1D to be D minus R1, and P2D will be D minus R2. And we'll rephrase the question, is D minus R1, D minus R2 equal to D minus R2, D minus R1. So I could uh, plug in a, f a function f and then see what I get. But what I'm going to do instead is use some of the algebraic properties that we have before. So somewhere up here, here we go, we'll use this property right here. This property is the distribution property. It is not a uh, commutative property right here. So we're going to use a distributive property to show uh, we have commutative. So I get to distribute. I'll distribute this direction first. So we have <coughs> d minus r1d minus d minus r1 r2. And these are multiplications. I don't really want to draw a dot. I'm going to erase all these dots, but for a a couple seconds, I'll write the dots in here. These are multiplication dots. Not We're not taking a derivative of R2. These are all multiplications happening here. If I put a function in F, that would be derivative right there. That would actually be the operation happening. But if I don't plug in a function F, this is an operator that's not actually operated already. It's just waiting to operate. So I distribute it one way, now we're going to distribute this direction. So I have dd minus r1d minus dr2 plus r1, r2. And dd is d squared. r1d, I'm going to change the order. You can swap the order of constant multiples. So I just arbitrarily started on the left side. What I'm going to do now is cheat and go over to the right side. And what I'm going to do at the end is flip everything upside down. So let's do the same thing on the right side. I'm going to just foil it right away. That's exactly what we did on the left. We basically foiled. I just did it. To properly foil, you're really distributing one direction and then distributing the other direction. That's what foiling is. So I'm going to just do all that at one time here. We have d squared minus r2d minus r1d plus r1, r2. Oh, look at that. That's the same thing. So that's the exact same thing we wrote here, just those two middle terms changed order. So I'm just going to go ahead and write d minus r2, d minus r1. So what this tells us, yes, we can change the order. So multiplication of polynomial operators is commutative. So the answer up here, yes, it is. You ready for function composition? Hopefully you're ready. All right. We are going to find P1 
of d plus a constant. So we'll just go with b for our constant here. Where regular p of d will just be summation a equals zero to n aka dk. So all we're going to do is replace d by d plus b. So we have summation ak. Now you can't just go d plus b to the k. What is wrong with what I wrote right there? Yep, we got to raise the whole d, the whole sum to the k power. Now that gets annoying if your k starts to get bigger than two or three because you have to just distribute it out. Like if k is seven, it's going to be a huge mess. Seven degree polynomial. So easier to write down than to compute. K. It's an ambiguous K. But yeah, there should all be Ks. Oh, I was referring to the top in the right, but yes. now, now I know they're all, they're all Ks. Ks. Yeah. All right, so we're going to summarize all the rules. And to save some ink, we're going to let P1 just stand in for P1 of D and P2 <coughs> to be P2 of D. So I'm not going to write the of D of D every single time. Just like when we're writing out a bunch of calculus stuff, I don't write of X of X of X every single time. Just, we just know it's derivative with respect to X or antiderivative with respect to X. Uh, so we got our commutative law, which is P1, P2 equals P2, P1. That's commutative law. Associative law, P1, P2, P3 equals, you could do P1, P2, then P3. And distributive law, P1 times P2 plus P3 is P1, P2 plus P1, P3. So that's basically all the laws and all the al algebraic properties written down together. So commutative, associative, and distributive. So now we're ready for the exponential shift theorem for polynomial operators. So we spent a huge amount of time building up all the rules for how these operators work. We haven't really done anything cool with them yet. The coolest thing you saw is you can multiply, algebraically multiply them together, would be the same as doing one operator and then the second operator. That's about the only cool thing you've seen so far. Everything else has just been rules and definitions. So this is where things to start to get interesting. If PD is that standard AN DN plus, I'll just shortcut it all the way to A0. We know what it looks like. Then PD of U U is going to be a function UE to the AX is equal to e to the ax p of d <coughs> plus a u. This is important enough to put a box around. It looks pretty random and arbitrary right now. Where a is a real number, u is a c I have written SC infinity. I think it only needs to be a CN function, but I'll just copy down what's in the notes. 
So what does that C infinity mean? Infinite derivatives. So we can differentiate it an infinite number of times. Pretty sure it only needs to be n or n plus 1 differentiable, but that's just what's in my notes. So we'll go with that. All right, we're going to prove this tomorrow.